Just like the roots of a plant attach to the soil and give it nourishment, well, history can serve a similar purpose for us. Where we come from, or our roots, keep us grounded by providing a foundation for our future. It also acts as a source of inspiration that nourishes our creativity. So in today's show, we'll discover that our roots run deep in the past, but still have relevance today. Look at these awesome flowers. I just love them. These are peonies and they're, I don't know, they're right at the top of my favorites. And this particular variety is one that I planted, was when I first bought this property, so they're really special to me. And I planted a boxwood circle around them and I filled this bed with peonies because I remember them from when I was a little kid. My grandmother had all kinds of peonies growing everywhere. But you know, in some parts of the country, peonies don't do very well because they need a long, cool period during the winter, a period of dormancy, a chill period. But this variety is one that has been long standing in many gardens throughout the South and can take warmer winters. It's a variety called Festiva Maxima. Now, Festiva Maxima has been around for a long time since the 1850s and she is such a great performer and the fragrance oh my gosh it just takes you back it, it's just fantastic but i will say this i feel very regrettable that i have not put cages around them to help support these big blooms because if we get a rainfall and it'll weight the blooms down and it's such a bummer when they hit the ground and the water splashes up on them and it gets soil all over them you can't even really cut them and wash them and bring them in the house so you've kind of lost the season. So I like to put a wire cage around them. Now, one thing that I learned a long time ago, let's take this one for instance. If you want a really gigantic peony bloom, you can come along and you can take these little side buds and you can just pinch those off. You would typically do it a little earlier in the season and that'll make that one bloom in the center really large. As you can see, it's surrounded by this circular border of boxwood called green velvet. And it's such a beautiful view from upstairs looking down. And having a circular bed with these long lasting perennials in the center is such an old fashioned idea. So it fits the farm perfectly. Coming up, we'll visit Colonial Williamsburg to check out some time tested growing tips. Stop in at the Arkansas State Fair to pass along poultry of the past to the next generation and we'll prepare a delicious stew using a modern version of a classic cook pot. Exploring Colonial Williamsburg is like taking a step back in time. While I was there, I met up with my friend, Laura Viancourt, to learn how gardening ideas from the 1700s are still being used today. Laura, it's so beautiful here in Williamsburg this time of year. It's, it's one of my perfect. favorite times to visit. Mine too. I'm glad you're here now. This is our interpretive site of gardening where people can see how gardening was done in the 18th century and they look over the fence and it connects them to plants. And not only can you see some of the heritage varieties that would have been grown in the 18th century here in Virginia, but you can also see some methods by which they were grown, like you have these wonderful little hot houses. That's right. My goodness, what beautiful lettuce. I know, look how pretty they are. We have the brown dutch, mm. tennis ball, Aleppo and Koss. I mean, this is a flower arrangement right here. And the advantage here is that you could get this lettuce growing weeks, if not a month ahead of right. normally planting it outdoors. That's right. In the 18th century, gardening reflected status and they had professional gardeners that could use hot beds and cold frames. Keep them warm at night, but most importantly, take them off during the day so you don't have cooked lettuce. Once they get started in the cold frame and hot beds, we then move them out into the garden. But we need to protect them on these cool evenings. Yeah. So in the 18th century, they would have covered them with these bell jars. Those are and so beautiful. Little mini greenhouses. <laughs> Just, but think about the labor. Every oh, night, wow. 
coming over, covering them up, and then taking them off. Yeah, you did. Again, you have, the you day. have an army of gardeners. That's right. So and they're so beautiful in the garden. They look like art. Mm -hmm, they do, and they're great to bring inside too. You know, very popular for garden art inside. Mm -hmm, terrariums and things like that. Exactly. Yeah, is that broccoli over there? It is. And it's purple broccoli. And look at these hoops or these twig structures you have over the broccoli. I know. Here we are using branches to make a support that you could lay cloth or paper over to protect the tender plants. And this is, this is a practice that you would have seen in the 18th century. Right. And yeah. sometimes it was actually to keep plants dry. For example, we know melons like it dry. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we will actually use it to keep the plants dry so that they don't get too much rain on them. It's hard mm. to find purple broccoli in a store today, but here you can just pick it. Please yeah, sample I'll try some. That. Mm. Mm, it's so tender and it's so delicious. I love it. Mm. It's very pretty. It has a vibrant yes. flavor to it. Now, yeah. when you cook it, it loses its purpleness, so that's why I like to use it in salads. Mm, very good. Oh, it's a pleasure to be back in Williamsburg. We are so glad that you are back. Thanks, mm, Alan. Thank you so much. Come back again. I can't wait. Let's try out a bygone bread recipe when Garden Style returns. While I was in Colonial Williamsburg, I decided to experience the city in depth by getting into costume and talking with some of the locals. I visited Great Hope's Plantation Pasture and Galt Apothecary, and Campbell's Tavern. It was there I met Chef Linwood Blizzard and discovered his recipe for a true colonial staple, spoon bread. Linwood, thank yes, you so sir. much for letting me come back of here. Of course, and, I, a pleasure to have you in the kitchen. And learning some things oh, about 18th century cooking. Oh, yeah. okay. So spoon bread. Yes, sir. Yeah, so spoon bread would have been a staple on the table, yes, kind of served like bread, but yes, this sir. actually has a, a almost a pudding-like pudding quality to it. Yes, sir. And if you sweeten it up and add berries, and that's where it can actually become mm -hmm. a dessert. For dessert. First step is to mix all your dry ingredients together. You okay. have your cornmeal. So we have cornmeal. About how yeah. much cornmeal that's do we have? That's about a cup and a half. Cup and a half of cornmeal. All yes, right. Yes, sir. And then and we've got then you uh, have your sh sugar. Sugar. All right. About and, three teaspoons. And I guess if you want it sweeter, you just add more if sugar. You want it sweeter, add more sugar. Yeah, and what's this, a little salt? Salt. About okay. a teaspoon of salt. Salt, okay. Then you add your Boiling hot water. The water has to be boiling because it doesn't boil, the cornmeal won't cook. Okay, so we just brought this over and it is boiling yes, hot. So here we go. You're gonna stir while I pour. Okay. All right. Whew, that is hot. Yeah. Yeah, look at that. So that's actually cooking the cornmeal. It's cooking the cornmeal. Okay. Because if you don't cook the cornmeal, it'd be grainy. Okay. So you gotta cook the cornmeal. This cooks about maybe 10 minutes. Okay. So you cook the cornmeal in. So you just keep stirring and add that. The butter okay. to it. And what? How much butter are we putting in here? Four tablespoons. Four tablespoons yeah. of butter. All right. And the whole time the corn is cooking. Yes, sir. It's about a cup and a half of milk. Okay. All right, cup and a half of milk. And there's the eggs. So the eggs. Woo, those will look good. This will Farm give it, eggs. This will give it that putting effect. Yeah, yeah. Then once it cools about ten minutes, then we add our baking powder to it. Baking powder. Yes, sir. Here we go. All right. Stir that in. Getting a little reaction there, it looks yeah, like. Yeah, that's what I say. That's good, though. So at home, you can get any type of casserole that you want to use. All but right. It's all important to butter the casserole for it, lightly butter it. Okay. And then you pour the mixture into it and sure. put it in the oven. Don't it. want it to stick. Okay. okay. Right. So you just pour in the mixture there. Pour the mixture into the. You want about two thirds full. You don't want too full because it's going to rise. When it rises, it okay. rises off the pot if it yeah. doesn't. Okay. Yeah. And then and you put this into the oven. We've preheated the oven, right? To yes, what, sir. 350? Preheat oven 350 first. Bake it for? 30, 35 minutes. Nice golden top want, on it. Golden top and you want to be firm, have a gel-like effect to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. here we have a nice golden Beautiful. brown spoon bread. Okay. So we're going to make this a dessert now. Okay. All if right. you use it for a course, you serve it just like this, you take it and set it on the table and everybody would Cut it. Would they cut it like cornbread well, or just dip spoon. it out with a spoon? They were spoon. They spoon bread. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So, so let's spoon that. So we're going to serve it as a, as a dessert. Mm -hmm. We're going to put it on here in our bowl. 
Looks beautiful. Then we're gonna take it and top it with uh, blueberries. Oh, look at that. A dollar whipped cream on top. Blueberry or two on top, you can. Yeah, save a few for the top. There we there go. There you go. Uh, lovely. Thank now, you now, so now much. Now, you serve as a, as a, with your meal, and you have a big dollop of butter the same way. So you put butter on top if you were just serving as yeah, spoon bread. Yeah, you're serving as, as spoon bread <laughs> on your plate. Just a few you more calories. A, the more butter, the better. <laughs> I bet. Exactly. I bet. Linwood, thank you so much. Okay, sir. A great pleasure. No, okay. Yeah. After the break, we've got heritage birds and a new spin on a traditional stew. The Heritage Poultry Conservancy is all about preserving these great heritage birds that were a part of, well, the farm scene back in the 18th, 19th, early 20th centuries. Many of them have been threatened. Many of these breeds are beautiful and dual purpose birds, but they're no longer useful in the industrial farm complex system. So what we try to do is preserve the genetics of these birds for a number of reasons. One reason is that these birds have strong genetics. So if anything happened to the flocks that are currently being raised for commercial purposes, we could go back to some of these heritage breeds and build back up a new genotype that could be used in the industrial farm complex. However, the main reason for having the conservancy and giving out birds and awards is to promote kids and their involvement in raising poultry, and that's what this is about today. So these kids wrote essays about why they wanted certain birds and why they support the heritage poultry. They're being rewarded today with birds, prize money, as well as some feed. You know, it's a lot of fun getting these kids started with some of these different breeds of birds, particularly some of these heritage breeds. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna follow along now, check in with them and see how they're doing. Because you know what? This show will be back around in another year and they'll be showing some of them. We wanna see how they do. After the break, a new twist on a traditional stew. You know, I really enjoy cooking, and I'm a history buff, so I actually enjoy the history of cooking. And you don't have to read too much to come up with the word Dutch oven. And a Dutch oven is really just a big, heavy cast iron container with a lid that's used to cook things on a very slow way. It's, it was developed at a time when you really couldn't manage the, the heat source very well. Today, what I'm doing is I'm using a French oven which is an improvement over the old Dutch oven in that the French oven is enameled, so it cuts down on burning and sticking, and it's also a lot easier to clean. So what I'm doing today is I'm doing a friend's recipe for chicken sausage and kale stew. It's really, really good. And what I'm gonna start with is about two tablespoons of olive oil, and I have this French oven on medium heat. I'm gonna take four cloves of garlic, that have been just sliced thinly. Move this all around, there we go. And then I'm gonna take 24 ounces of chicken sausage. And you can see here I've just cut it into little bite-sized pieces, and I'm gonna add this to the French oven. Here we go. I love chicken sausage. It has such a marvelous flavor, and this is a wonderful recipe. Now my friend Christopher Tidrick is a great gardener. He's the one that turned me on to this and it's become one of the favorites here at the farm. So what I'm doing is I'm just stirring all this together and I'm just gonna let this cook for about 10 minutes. The idea with this recipe is to cook it very slowly for about an hour. 
Mm, this is looking about right and it smells so good, you just cannot believe it. Okay, so let's go to the next step. Now it's just a, a matter of assembling some ingredients. What I have here are some diced tomatoes. You have 24 ounces of those. Add that. Yep, that certainly quietens this down a little bit. And then I have 30 ounces of cannellini beans, which are just basically white kidney beans, Italian style. And there they go. These are from a can, so they're, they're already cooked to some point. And then we're going to add some chicken stock. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna add four cups of chicken stock. Pour that evenly across the soup like this. Now remember, I have this on low, so we want this to simmer. Now, the last thing we're gonna add is kale. What I did is I took a bundle of fresh kale and I thoroughly washed the leaves. I wanted to make sure it was completely clean and there was no grit. And then I stripped the kale leaves such that I removed the stems. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna evenly distribute this and work it in so that I just don't have a lot of kale on top of the soup. I'm gonna pop the lid on it in just a moment. I'm just gonna kind of work this fresh kale in. And this will cook down very quickly, but letting it simmer for about an hour will make sure that what stems might be in here will be thoroughly cooked. And then of course, you just want to salt and pepper to taste. Like that, so stir it in. There we go, so that's integrated fully. And now it's just a matter of taking the French oven lid and placing it on top and let that simmer for, like I said, about an hour. You're gonna love this recipe. Give it a try. Garden Style returns right after the break. You know, William Shakespeare wrote, what's past is prologue, and I couldn't agree more. You know, our roots set a certain context for us, both for the present and the future. I hope you've picked up some new old ideas that you can use around your home and garden in today's show. I hope you'll follow us on Facebook for inspiration and ideas every day. Until next time, for Garden Style, I'm Alan Smith. Turn around here and get our picture made. Here we go. Ah. <laughs> you can't blame the bird, can you? All right, very good. Here you go. Can you hold him? This girl knows how to handle a turkey. There we go.